just and got over into Leviticus today, and I was thinking about Leviticus, and I was looking at it, and uh, just thinking about God's God of order there in Leviticus, and I know that's ahead of where I'm at, but uh, just all the details that God gives uh, there for the, uh, whether it be for the uh, burnt offerings and the different sacrifices all the way in through the tabernacle. Um, that's just been amazing, the God of detail. <clears throat> and I know sometimes when we're, and how clean he wanted things there in the book of Leviticus. And I'm, I know, again, I know I'm over there and just kind of segue, uh, taking off here a little bit. But then, I, like I said, I've been reading through here. And back in Exodus chapter number one, the Bible says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came uh, into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob, and Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died and, his, and all his brethren and all that generation. Now, as, as we look at this, I'm going to get down here to the point that you know, I want to see here in just a minute. But you have Joseph that has been around for, um, if I remember correctly, seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. So he's been around for 14 years in the land of Egypt as the uh, number two man there. Uh, the, think about how many children are born in that 14 years in the land of Egypt. How many children are raised during that 14 years in the land of Egypt? We go back and we look and we celebrated the 20th anniversary of 9-11 here just a few weeks ago. Um, and we look at it and there's a generation of young people that were not alive when that happened. But it's up to us as the older generation that were alive when that happened to remind them of that. And as we come to this point, this is what has gone on in the land of Egypt. And Egypt has this now this second nation just across the way there. It's a now a neighbor. And people, and where I want to get to this at, and the children of Israel in verse number seven were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. It's the thought I want to think on this morning, which knew not Joseph. And I, as I read through this several weeks ago, I thought, why did they not know Joseph? This had to be, a, uh, and he said all that, gener and back up here, uh, and Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. I, want to, I don't know the time frame on this, but 70, 80, 100 years. You say, Why? Because you have to stop and think that Joseph dies and then the generation behind him. Those young people that were born during that seven years of plenty and that seven years of family famine. And you say, why, are, why, why about, what about them? They knew Joseph. Those, those, if, if you were born at the first year of, of plenty, when Joseph first took office, you would be 14 years old when he, when the famine was over. And you would remember, I believe that in time, particularly because then you're going to be seven years old. So you're going to remember seven years of not having a whole lot. So then now that young person has, that generation has to die. Why? Because they remember, hey, there was a guy from that nation over there that's our neighbor that he saved our lives. I remember mom and dad having to go to him and get food. He saved our life. But it was that generation that didn't tell the following generation. Not only in the land of Egypt, but what about those Israelites over there in the land of Goshen? You say, well, they're right next door. I said, yes, but they, had, they probably had to trade. They had, there, there had to be commerce between the two of them. Why did they not know? Why did that new king not know the heritage that Joseph had left behind? And as I got to thinking about that, and as I looked at where we are in America, I believe the answer to the question is nobody told. You so said, why are we at where we're at in America? Because nobody told them. Nobody reminded them of what God had done for us. Nobody put God in, in, and I don't mean this disrespectful, nobody put God in his place 
and reminded and told the children of Israel that, hey, God did this. God did this. And I don't mean you put God in his place like you corrected him. No, you put God in his rightful places. He was the one that oversaw. He was the one that brought them in. He was the one that brought this man into Egypt to save our lives. That's what I mean by, by putting God in his place. And you say, well, what have we done? We in America have removed God from his place of preeminence and being God Almighty and said, no, we got here on our own power. We've looked at some of the mistakes we've made. And yes, but I'm thankful that God has blessed us to where we're at today. And we need, as Christians, we need to remind this generation and the generation coming and, remind, and put God back in his rightful place as preeminent in our lives and to put God there. And you say, why? Because we are in a situation where there arose another king, which knew not, may I say it this way, the Lord. That's right. But you know what? We still have, just like was right here in the land of Goshen, you still had a God fearing people. And their job was to tell a godless nation about him. I wonder if Israel stopped telling Egypt about God. You say, why? Why? Because this new king didn't know Joseph. And if we were to compare America to Egypt and, and look back at it, we would have to say that, you know, what we're our, we are where we're at because of a generation of Christians and multitudes of generations of Christians didn't tell the world and didn't tell some of our senators and some of our, that there was a God and that needed, that we needed to respect and to honor and to give glory and he was God Almighty. And I believe that this same thing happened. That those Israelites didn't communicate their relationship with the Lord. Hey, God brought us, look at where God provided. And you have to admit even this, to bring them into Egypt for, you say, well, to bring them into Egypt so that they would live, they would have had to have admitted that they were wrong somewhere. But then they would have had to admit that God led them all the way. So what do you admit they had to admit? Those, those, those brothers, how many of y'all, you don't like airing your dirty laundry? You don't like letting things out and saying, hey, yeah, we did our brother wrong. But that nation of Israel would have had to have said, we did one of our own wrong, but look at what God did. Amen. Look at what God did. He sent him down here. Even though we meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Look at how God preserved us in our own selfish greed. Look at what God did for us. And look at what God did for you. But they forgot my challenge to us today and my thought today is to remember and to tell what God has done for us. Where God has brought us from. Where God is taking us to. And to tell a lost and dying world that Christ still saves and He's still the only way to get to heaven. Amen. So as we look back at this verse today, now there arose a new, up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Are we going to be the generation that forgets to tell our generation about God. Let's not be that generation. But TJ, do you have a course for us?